This is an introduction. It is also an apology. I'm apologizing for the very poor quality of the audio you're about to listen to. I recorded this on location without my usual microphone, which meant I thought, oh, to save uh, to save me whilst I'm traveling, carrying a big microphone, I will buy some lapel mics and use them. The lesson learned here is if you buy cheap, you buy twice. So uh, that will teach me for being tight. I did what I could with the audio with my limited um, audio editing knowledge and I think I did an okay enough job to put this out and I would really recommend you you put up with the with the distortion that you might hear and echo but and listen it's a great podcast it's one I was very excited to record it's a guest I've wanted on for ages and you, you, you're gonna love it look the quality of the audio isn't great the quality of the conversation I think is is fantastic so do be patient with the bad quality. I apologize for it, but I hope you still enjoy. My name is Athena Cabenu. I'm a stand-up comedian, writer, and podcaster, and a parent, which is great. But as you will know, if you listen regularly, um, my child can't speak yet, and I struggle to get a conversation out of her. So to help me with that predicament, I invite a friend round keep my company. Uh, this episode is a, a deviation. In fact, it's, a, it's what you call, what is it, a surprise episode? It's a surprise episode. Uh, this time I've invited you round. Yeah, you invited me round. <laughs> so I travelled, what, 3,000 miles? Yeah. 3,000 miles to Accra, Ghana. Yes, we are in the heart of um, Ghana. Welcome to my podcast, um, Sylvia Arthur. And welcome to my house, Athena Kublin. <laughs> <laughs> No, this place is called Echo Mog, which is in the kind of North Lagon, East Lagon, sorry, not East Lagon, North Lagon, West Lagon vicinity. So you know those kind of people who live in Kilburn and they say, I live in West Hampstead. Right. Yeah, I could say I live in <laughs> North Lagon, but actually this is Echo Mog. Can I just say, like coming from London now, I've just walked into this property and I'm like, why do we live in London? In these, in these shoe boxes. Well, you as you... Are these marble tiles you've got here? Yeah, marble. yeah. I mean, to be honest, that's kind of why I live in Ghana and not in London anymore, <laughs> because, yeah, this is a very nice uh, property, as you can see. It costs me, let me tell you, a fraction, an absolute fraction of the price that I was paying to live in my little studio in London. And so, I yeah, exactly. Pay. But I mean, <laughs> let me, let me not like sugarcoat it. Obviously we have challenges here. Like we haven't had running water from the tap for about six weeks now. Wow. Six weeks. Obviously we have a water tank. If you can afford to have a water tank, you have a water tank, but yeah, it's not that it's, um, you know, it's not all roses. No, um, it's, it's true. Um, but you learn to live with it for sure. How's light out coming on in Ghana? Actually, the light out is not so much an issue anymore. Um, we had like a light out yesterday for about six hours or four hours or so. Yeah. But that was the first one that we've had in a very, very long time. If you'd have come here about seven or six years ago, oh, that was terrible. Like every... Actually, there was more light out than there was light on. <laughs> so let's just put it that way. But now it's it's not so much of an occurrence. It's so much so that, you know, when it happens, it's kind of like, oh, we've got light out today. It's, yeah. it's a so bit of an event. Floor, a balcony. I do have a balcony. I have a uh, substantial room space. <laughs> I have obviously an ensuite. Every room is en suite, you know. Yeah, there's my bathroom there. There's no running water there. Yeah, but, no, but they'll bring the bill. They'll bring the bill for sure that they'll expect us to pay. There's no running water. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a Ghana design in the bathroom in that, you know, you should take a look and see where the toilet is facing. <laughs> yeah, go, go and have a look now. And I have a friend uh, who pays like a lot. <laughs> yes, very silly design when they could have put it in the corner there. But anyway, the the, exactly. That's, that's Ghana design but let me tell you I have a friend who spends a lot more money to live in airport residential area yeah. and his rationale for doing that is he says you know I like to go into a house and know that if I turn on the light switch the tap isn't going to start running because <laughs> that is Ghana design but, but so and not just design just like construction exactly like we're staying in um, quite a, a posh part of a craft yes yes in this apartment complex and it's just there's so much snagging 
is uh, when I say <laughs> things that just don't work, tower rails hanging off the floor. Things that don't make sense. Not only do they not work, they don't make sense. Yeah, probably. Yeah, this is this makes sense, but everything's <laughs> badly. Yeah, something called a Friday afternoon job. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, just sitting there, it'll be fine. Um, you know, everything's leaking, but everything's functional. Yeah, but it's just such a shame. Like it's not like why can't it just be right? Yeah, exactly. But that's why, for example, if you were to build your own place, you could obviously get everything right, but you would literally have to stand over the work people and make sure that they do it the way that you want them to do it and I'll give you an example for example in the library where um, the space that I used to be I wanted to have these glass doors put onto two of the shelves because that's where I had like signed books and things I didn't want people to be able to take and so I went to this guy this carpenter guy whoever he was this glass guy and I said please can you put two doors on these shelves and I was going to London, I came back, he would put these two doors on the shelf, but I wanted everything white. There was this black design element that he's, he'd incorporated into the design of these doors. I said, that's not why I asked for, why did you do that? He said, oh, but it's a design, everybody's doing it. It looks good. And I said, listen, I have no black in this library. All the shelves are white, I want it white. He said, oh, but you've got black chair. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, people follow your instructions, 80% of the instructions, you know, and then they'll do 20% creativity. Uh, I would probably say it's, it's a lot more than that. I'd probably say it's about 60% instructions and 40% <laughs> creativity. Um, I'm glad you put up the library. Tell me what it is. Yeah, so I have a library or I had a library up until uh, a couple of weeks ago or a week or so ago. And the library um, I created in uh, December 2017. And I started it with all my own books, about 1,300 of my own books that I'd collected over the years, but I couldn't accommodate them in my uh, flat in London, which was a studio, as I said. And I, I had a place in Brussels as well, because I was working in Brussels, couldn't accommodate it there. So over the years, I would ship them back to my mum's house in Kamasi, which is the second city in Ghana. It's about four hours from Accra. And then every time I would go and visit her, I would just see all these books sitting there and think that it's such a waste that people don't have the opportunity to read these books so I decided to start the library and it was only when I moved here in June 2017 that I thought yeah now is the time I'm going to do it so like I said I opened it in December 2017 um it was it's such a a space that brings people together from all over uh, the world and the diaspora in particular um but also we do a ton of outreach work which is actually where my heart is most definitely so we go out into communities uh, not just in Accra, but across Ghana. Uh, we have a community, a small library in uh, the Ashanti region in a place called Kumawu. We have another one in uh, Greater Accra in Ashaiman. And then we're currently doing one in a place called Ensutem, which is in the eastern region. So, yeah, that's definitely where my heart lies. And what kind of public provision is there for libraries in Ghana? Um, well, there are public libraries here, but the state of them is not great, let's just say. Um, like the, they have books that you wouldn't really want to read. Are they quite white books? Yeah, they're very yeah. white books. Enid, Enid Blyton, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the famous five. The books that my dad bought me because that's what he knew. Exactly. And that, those are the books actually that the parents request when they come to my library for their children. So to be fair, I do have Enid Blyton. You have like a, a, a special line, like, like take my hand. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a clockwork orange, you have to deprogram them. You do, you do. But to be honest, I think that's going to take a lot of work to do because we're talking actually about middle class parents. So let me just explain uh, like how the setup of the library works. So for the library that was in West Lagon, you pay to be a member and you can take home, if you're an adult, two books at a time or a, a child can take four books at a time. And so this is the thing, the kind of people who come to West Lagon, who live in West Lagon, it's a very middle class area. And so it's middle class people who tend to use it, but in theory, it's their subscriptions that are supposed to pay for the outreach work. But obviously it doesn't work like that. It's very subsidized by myself. But it's these middle class parents who are the ones who say, you know, give my child, I want... Th- you know, the famous five or the secret seven yeah. for my child, because as you say, that's what they've been brought up on. Anything that has proximity to, to Europeanness exactly. must be good. And uh, anything that is African or about Africa must be like backwards. That's exactly the thinking. And it's also a case of education is white, libraries are white. And so if the book is written by a white author, then it must be a good book, if you see what I mean. And if it's written by an African author, then it's, you know, well, what do they know? What can they tell us? We live it, so we know it. And it's kind of, that's the thinking. It's, as you're saying, it's a decolonization is needed of the whole 
literary world and sphere because people think that writing is white you know they think they associate writing and they associate literature with academics um and they don't see the value of reading for pleasure unfortunately and the irony is is, is that it is the reading that will decolonize you and I exactly my yes journey, like as as my reading got blacker like <laughs> my brain got blacker, <laughs> so to speak. But reader, it's not just but it's not just the kind of a race thing like just generally as i read more widely i became like, uh, it was like an, impro- an, an improvement on myself. Like, exactly. Okay, I was getting to like the next level. Exactly. And I think that it actually kind of crystallizes what the issue is here in that people think that they have access to Africanness. So I'm not even going to say blackness. I'll say Africanness specifically. So they don't feel like, why should I read about it? And I'm talking predominantly about not the middle class people now. I'm just talking about just in general. They think, well, you know, we live in Africa. We know Africa. Why should we read Africa? And they want to read the world. Unfortunately, that's all they've been taught. All yeah. they've been taught is the world. Exactly. Which is, just so you can touch me, but that's entirely opposite uh, to the European view, which is like, we just want ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. And But that's why, you know, you know, I worked in Brussels, as you know, for a long time. And, you know, you can ask somebody on the street in Brussels what's, what's the capital of Ghana or even where is Ghana? And they couldn't tell you, yeah. but you can ask most people on the street here, where is the UK or where is, what's the capital of the UK? And they'll all tell you London, yeah. you know, you'll see kids walking around and this is obviously the power of uh, sport and the capitalism of sport with, you know, uh, the football shirts with Ronaldo or Messi or Chelsea. Or Chelsea. Yeah. Chelsea is a big, a big club here. You know, we are very outward looking people because we have been, colonized to be yeah. whereas obviously in europe and in america it's the opposite it's like well we rule the world why do we need to know about anywhere else and they're backwards anyway do you see like do you think that's changing or do you think that other than the work you're doing and other individuals it's probably just staying the same or getting the work i would say it's you know ghana is a very class-based society and people don't often talk about ghana in these terms and africa in terms in these terms but you know i would say with the middle class there is definitely at least a perception of being woke (laughs) you know there is they want to be seen as woke they want to you know read Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie, you know, and all these African writers who are internationally celebrated, yes. However, I think from a, an institutional and a governmental perspective, no, definitely not. It's very much, this is the education system. This is what you've got to learn. Let's read Shakespeare. Let's read Enid Blight and let's read this. I don't feel from a, an education perspective, there is that uh, desire to turn to Africa or to turn to blackness, no. Was it always your intention to come to live in Ghana? No, definitely not. I mean, after, so I was living and working in Brussels uh, since 2010. I think in 2013, I returned to London, then went to Barcelona for a year. Um, I was in, you know, spent significant amount of time in Canada and America. I came to Ghana in June 2017, mainly because obviously we'd had the, the referendum for Brexit yes. in uh, in May. And... I just, just literally you're like okay fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I thought I'd take the initiative and you know <laughs> just get get to step in but no I think it was like a confluence of all kinds of things it was the Brexit referendum the cost of living in London it's is obviously high but I should say like I'm a hundred percent a Londoner like you know you ask me where I'm from you cut me through I am London completely um so I still go to London quite often um but I see myself as living in Ghana. I've been here now for two and a half years, which is the longest I've been probably anywhere since living in Brussels. Um, and yeah, I think you can have the best of both worlds. It wasn't my intention to say I'm coming to Ghana and I'm going to live here forever and ever. And even if I don't, I don't see it as a problem. I feel no shame if I was to go back to London and live next week, for so example. Call London home. I call London home. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about Brexit. <laughs> so I basically found the UK to be increasingly, increasingly unpleasant. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm a fairly, I'm very London centric as well. Yes. I find very much, my roots are very much in the UK. Yeah. And London. Um, so I'm bringing up my daughter. Mm-hmm. But I found, what's, the two things that are going backwards in, in the UK are the, the kind of the intellectual conversations mm-hmm. that are happening. So you can turn on the TV and somebody fairly high profile on a very high profile platform would just be saying things that are just like wrong. Yeah. Like 
in incredibly incorrect and um so they're wrong being, and strong wrong wrong and strong yeah and they're being allowed to do it yeah under this principle of free speech and you've got to let people say this stuff so we can debate them which is really extraordinary yeah because they're only ever really allowed to say this stuff when it's kind of anti-black or anti-black and brown people yes but they're not really allowed to go on tv and and insult gay people on the web gay so i'm not doing yeah you know that's that's not i'm not sort of separate them i'm just saying they could never do that they couldn't do it against disabled people yeah they couldn't even do it against tall people <laughs> or ginger people but if on tv said you know black people can be a bit a bit outspoken that would get broadcast yes you know and the thing that t- the thing that made me um, think I, I can't take this anymore. Was that bizarre enough? You're in Love Island. Yes, I've never seen it, but I know. Yeah, obviously. I, I yeah, seen it either. But um, you see, you can't get away from clips of it. Yes, and I saw a clip of it a couple of years ago, and there was a silly white girl. Um, <laughs> and again, if I see silly white girl on TV, people would go nuts. But yeah, fine. and a silly white girl going, you know what? I just I don't like that member. We love mixed race boys. And it wow, cast. ITV2. Yeah. Like, this is editorially, you want to put that out, but also just kind of like, just morally and, um, like, that's just as racist as it comes. You know, I like my men black, but not too black. Yeah. It's, it doesn't get more racist than that. And yeah. white people or just people who are, who are controlling this are saying, no, 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 that's just an opinion. She likes light skin boys, doesn't like that. So there's a real ignorance about race, racism and what race is. Um, and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and what's like um, collective thought moving yeah. forward yeah. collective thought moving backwards so was that something you noticed as well? Um, definitely yes but one thing that I'll say is that since living here um, I think probably in around maybe six months after living here there seemed to be this plethora of books that were published and obviously I, w- I have a library so I'm interested in books a plethora of books that were published by black British writers about racism. So you had Afua Hirsch's British, you had Rene Edo Lodge's uh, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, and then you had Akala's Natives. And I honestly couldn't read any of those books because having been here for six months as I was at the time, you just don't see, you're just not affected by racism in the same way. And you realize just how, um, how much of a burden it is actually when you're living in the UK that it's not when you're living here. So... Definitely, I felt all that. And maybe I didn't even know I was feeling it until I left the place, if you see what I mean. Because, you know, I'm walking around Accra sometimes and I'll see a billboard with a black woman on it or a black couple. And I'm disorientated suddenly. I'm like, wow, why is there a black person? There's a black person on that billboard. And then I think, well, actually, I'm in a black country. Why shouldn't there be a black person on that billboard? And not even that I'm in a black country. In the UK, which is, what is it, an 8%... In London, at least. Uh, well, no, in London, it's more. It's probably 30%. In the UK, it's 8% non-white. Why shouldn't there be people of color on billboards and things like that? Yet we're still having these conversations many, many years after Windrush and after things, and even the Windrush scandal, I mean, you know. So I, I know what you mean. And, you know, living in Ghana, I am very connected to the UK still. Dare I say it, I listen to the Today program every morning on Radio 4. Obviously, I have, you know, BBC News and Sky News and all that kind of thing. And seeing this whole business with Meghan and Harry and Lawrence Fox and all this kind of business, I just think to myself, wow, I can't believe I lived there and lived there. <laughs> I, I don't watch Washington Time anymore. Purely because yes. The discourse on it is so bad. Yeah, me too. I stopped watching I when I was I'm, there. If, I, if I'm going to watch a news program that's topical and that's about debate, I don't want the discourse to be basic and ignorant. Yeah. Um, and it, it astounds me some of the things people get away with saying. But not just that they get away with saying it. They say it. And, and they're, they're celebrated for it. Yeah, they clapped for it. Yeah, course. yeah, big time. So um, there's a saying, I think it's a Nigerian one, like when you cut the grass, the snakes will show. <laughs> yeah. Basically, what happens? Someone says something ignorant. They're cutting the grass, and then when everybody is cheering, they go, "Yeah, yeah politi- political correctness yeah. gone mad." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't racist. I didn't make that a slave. Yeah. And you just think, "Wow!" Like, but you know, sentiment of ignorance. Yeah, and I think that one thing that I have always said and believed that has now come to pass is that. Britain is fundamentally a conservative country. And I say that with a big C and a small C. It's a conservative country. I don't think it was ever this country of, obviously, yes, the NHS and blah, blah, blah. But you look at how many elections Labour have won in the past however many years and look at how many elections the Conservatives won. I'm telling you that the UK is a conservative country. Nothing that has come to pass has surprised me whatsoever. I agree. And that's why I'm personally infuriated with the Labour Party. Uh, for the past few years. Me too. And 
for two reasons. First of all, they were, particularly leadership, were just kind of like very dismissive of criticism. Um, and second of all, it, it's it's like they didn't, they weren't seeing what was in front of their eyes. Yes. Um, and what makes me sad is that for a long time, I was even afraid to say this is trash. You know, like, especially in the comedy world, there's a lot of commentary about yes. politics. The, the two things go hand in hand. So having a political opinion and being a comedian is quite a normal thing. Yeah. And it kind of felt like you weren't allowed to say I'm not a socialist. Like, yes. people say, no, we're socialists. Yeah. You know what that means? Yeah. You really want to centralise all production. <laughs> Are you sure about that? You're walking around in shoe express shoes. You know, <laughs> shoe <laughs> These people are capitalists. You're walking around, you've got an eye watch. Or is it exactly. Watch? Yes, an Apple watch, yeah. You're, you're, you're sitting there with your earbuds that are polluting the, what yeah. the earphones called? Um, those like, earbuds, yeah. yeah. They are like, the, the markup on those earbuds is ridiculous. Yeah. They are, they are, this, but, they will eventually stop working. They're designed to stop working. They are hideous. Yeah. There's a really good article um, about how hideous they are. And then you're going to call a socialist. And you're going to criticise me. <laughs> you know, and you're going to even silence people for, for disagreeing. So it's, it almost became really fashionable to kind of like hate profit. Yes. Hate people businesses. Yes. And money And to pretend you're into like climate issues. Yeah. Right? It didn't become fashionable to actually live practice. Yeah, practice. to live up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, I will say um in terms of having the library and it being a private library, I face that same criticism and it's a criticism that I face from myself within internally and one that I see on the internet all the time about the privatization of knowledge and libraries should be free and all this kind of thing. Well, yes, libraries should be free, but they're paid for by taxpayer money. Do you know what I mean? And when you live in a country where taxes aren't paid or if they're paid, they're not used for what they should be used for. It has to be paid somehow. Which is really interesting because we're in Ghana and I had the year of return. Now it cost, you know, it cost me 180 quid mm-hmm. to come here for reasons, right? So you can imagine okay. what that means for all the people who pay. Yes. That's taxation. It's tax, exactly. It's big time taxation. And the question will be, what do they do with that extra income that has been generated as a result of this? And, And let me just say, you know, one of the controversial political issues here is that the government made education free for all, which in theory you would think is a good idea, but you need to be able to have the resources and the infrastructure to be able to support that because now that education is free obviously everybody wants to send their child to school yeah. but do you have enough teachers do you have enough schools do you have enough classrooms do you have enough um, pencils no you don't and so that's the big issue here because now what they've done is that they've introduced this two this double track scheme it's called double track so uh, that means that one set of children will go to school for three months and then the other set of children will stay at home and then the other set of children will you know stay at home for three months and the other set will go now let me tell you the most passionate advocates of this are middle class people who are my friends and you know they'll say oh free education it's fantastic meanwhile ask them what schools they send their children to they send them to private schools where they're paying between 500 and a thousand dollars a term to send their children to these schools so if the free education system was so good why aren't they sending them to public to government schools same thing in the uk almost you know like people want comprehensive education like these same people, these corporates or whatever, will be at yeah. the grammar school. Yes. But when it comes to it, they've moved their kids to, like, <laughs> to gentrify it. Exactly, and yes. The next best academy. Yeah. Uh, what you say is really interesting as well about um, they want free education, but they don't have the money. Yeah. The government doesn't work quite that big ideas. It works about, um, it's about a circle. You get the money and you spend it. Yes. Now, how do most people make the money in Ghana? Lots of ways, but street vendors. Exactly. Taxis, roadside. Yes. People selling new stuff. In, in your car yeah. you can't tax that you, exactly tax yes so you've got a massive proportion of people on low income not even paid making any tax contributions you've got businesses in, in the UK if you open a business in London you're paying a minimum 10 grand business exactly business exactly so yeah when, when you know that's another thing too when we talk about what we have in the UK, we have to remember we have this amazing administrative system that sucks money out of our bank accounts. <laughs> like they're bits of mad. And yeah, have all the and before you get your 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 salary anyway, yeah, you know exactly. it's taken at source. So. Exactly, and then you've got the um, obviously the <laughs> centuries of colonialism and the money. That's the foundation. But that's the foundation. Yes, yes. Of it all, you know, yes. So we're starting from starting from scratch, um, and then we're not even we're not even sustaining the momentum that we've started. Exactly. We to collect collect the money. And which lip? I think this is a good. <laughs> Excuse me, this is a good point to bring up the school that we have a library in, in a Shyman, that the Library Laughs event that you held for us in October is going to fund a scholarship in that school. So let me tell you a bit about that school, because that's a private school. And it's a private school in 
in which the children um, or the parents pay 80 cities a term to send their children. So 80 cities is the equivalent of about 13 pounds a term to send your children. And they have about 500 children within the school. The first time that I went there, I was actually taken there by a young university student who had done a profile of the owner of the school called Auntie Grace. That's what everybody calls her. And she said, you really should go and see this school. It's run by this woman who is a, a change maker who I just profiled. So she took me there. And when I went to the school, I mean, obviously the children are beautiful, you know, uh, running around, being in the classroom, whatever. But this school is a skeleton of a structure. It's not a school with doors or windows and desks in the way that we would understand it to be in the UK. But they have teachers who are passionate about what they do. And they have a founder who's very passionate about what she does. She sends her children to that same school, right. which obviously goes to show her own faith in her own teachers and their whole system. But um, the reason why I brought that up is because like I said, we have a school library there, which we uh, donated uh, to the school. We donated about 300 books, but I also asked her, like, how much would it cost to plaster this room, to put windows in it, to put a door in it? And it was marginal. It was like maybe 300 US dollars and to paint it, to do all that kind of stuff because, and to do the shelves as well, because we already had the books that wasn't a cost. But I said to her that, you know, once we give you those books, what we would like you to do is to ask each parent to contribute one city a term. One city is about 70 5p not even that probably a term and you have 500 children so that's like 500 and something cities which is like roughly it was about 100 pounds at the time we can use that to buy new books every term and this is how it works so you'll have people like I say who will say free education free education but this is a private school that works for the community it serves now has a library which most if not all public schools do not have and yeah, it's actually making a difference and an impact in that community. So you can be dogmatic about your politics and say, I'm socialist, I'm conservative, I'm this. I prefer to be practical with mine. Another question I've been dying to ask you is that um, I've known you for years. Yes. And one thing I do know about you is your diet is quite limited. <laughs> yeah. I have. I think actually my diet has broadened over the years that I've known you. I just know you eat chips and saveloy. Yeah, but you know we don't get saveloy here, so. No. so what, how are you? So I'm, as it happens, like, this, and this might be to do with the fact that I wasn't brought up by Ghanaian. I'm very Ghanaian. Yes. Yes. It's my way of, of expressing <laughs> my heritage. Mm -hmm. um, so how? Are you, what are you eating? How are you getting by in the land of fufu? Yeah, I, I love okra though, but yeah, I love okra. I love okra and benku stew, um, but, but with no fish. Obviously, with goat meat. I've been in this heat, 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 i have been in this heat 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 it. Yeah. yeah I love that um I love boiled plantain as well with stew um but yeah my diet is kind of limited to that <laughs> yeah plantain okra and uh yeah rice obviously rice is I mean everywhere here I mean well this is the thing about Ghana food is in abundance in at least in the southern part of Ghana. yeah it's really amazing but it all comes from the north anyway it's an abundance up the from the north and I would definitely recommend that you go to northern Ghana obviously maybe not on this trip but um, no we've been to northern Ghana we went oh <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I might be on the yeah that's that's my daughter screaming yeah you should bring you should bring her in she can add a little soundtrack <laughs> all right, all right, hello little one <laughs> Oh yeah, food yeah, and yeah, so the north, north, yeah, northern Ghana. Yes, we went there when we came in two thousand and nine.
Um, but yeah, I mean, I went there um, about two months ago with a friend of mine who is a chef, a vegan chef from London. A vegan chef in Ghana? Yeah, so she's from London. She's only here for six months and she's doing like, a, she's writing a book about food and vegan food, plant-based food um, from an African perspective. And so we went up north um, and we visited some farms up there. Um, we met some really remarkable women farmers who... Um, you know, there are all kinds of issues associated with farming now. Um, and especially if you're a woman farmer, you've put your whole life into working the land so you can send your children to school to be educated and then they're educated and they don't want to work the land, obviously. Yeah. And so, you know, what happens to your farm and your livelihood? Um, but yeah, we, we met some really great people um, and talking about food and looking at food in ways that I hadn't even considered before because I just eat it. You know, I don't really, I haven't really been too conscious of where it comes from and that kind of thing. Yeah, and I, th- I think a lot of, um, in a country like Ghana where food grows quite easily. Yeah. Like, if you let, know about these things like the South, a lot of Southern guys on the water table. Yeah. Like, they basically drop food on the floor. <laughs> and there are two seasons or, or I don't know what it's called, but- The Harmattan season you know, and- Oh. You can harvest fruit twice a year. So okay. On the UK, mm-hmm. you have, you know, you've got four seasons. Yes. You harvest your food, depending on what you're growing once a year. And yeah. Grows. But here you get- Two, two mango seasons or uh, two avocado seasons yes. or whatever, which means food is so abundant because you're yeah. constantly growing it. But what... Um, and we actually have an abundance of rice, which is a big <laughs> issue here. I don't know if you've heard about it, that, um, you know, there's a campaign to get people to buy Ghanaian rice because we have so much of it and yet people prefer to buy Thai rice and, you know, other, all these other imported rices. <clears throat> which is um, damaging for our industry here for our farmers and so yeah that's a big issue at the moment why do you think you prefer Thai rice Just- do you know what they say it's the taste I don't know if that's true because I do think again to go back to the issue of class there is a very big uh Thing of keeping up with the Joneses here so you know it's I don't want to have just a regular phone I've got to have an iPhone 10 I don't want to eat Ghanaian rice I want to eat Thai rice it's all about appearances and aspiration unfortunately something I've noticed as well about something I feel very strongly about is um, very expensive places okay fine you're going to have places that are expensive in a city and places that are cheap but there are places in Ghana where the food is just unreasonable like yes. like the dishes are like a hundred CD yes. dishes and things like that. And then when you think about it, it's it's status. It's like they don't they just want they want certain people in these places. These places aren't even that nice. Yes. Uh, what's the or place? maybe the food isn't that nice. Like the place will be nice a lot of the time, you know, decor and stuff like that, and it'll be in a bougie area. Yeah. But maybe the food isn't exactly. that nice once you've paid a hundred cities for it. And there's this yeah, and you're right, it's that culture of um, status. Yes. Of doing symbolic things to say this is the kind of person that I am. Yes. It all over the place. Yeah. It's really interesting. What happens here? Like, I took place yesterday, and the menu didn't have any prices on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised that they had yeah. half the food on it, to be honest. Yeah, well, the, actually, they had, a, to be fair, everything we wanted, they had. It wasn't, okay. we don't have that, we don't have that, mm-hmm. we don't have that. Um, so that's credit to them. But when we asked how much it was, we were thinking, is that for us? Like, are you surprised if you heard our accent? Yeah. We put, like, 20 CDs on. But was it a bougie area? It, oh, it was Os- Osu. Oh, well, then that should be pretty... St- I mean, the prices will, there will be expensive or more expensive than everywhere else because it's a tourist area. Um, it was in the Okay. But it was, kind of, but it was, it was a nice place. Yeah. It was International Chop Bar, that's what it's called. <laughs> and, you know, here, if you put international in front of every, anything, that means it's, you know, it's world class. So you have lots of places that are called International School, International Chop Bar I hadn't heard of before. But, yeah, just put international in front of everything. I might call my library International Library. <laughs> I've known you for ages. Yeah. Uh, we used to work together in Hackney yeah. Um which is, was nice. <laughs> Remember when we came to Ghana in 2009 and we were in a bar somewhere <laughs> and this guy comes up to us and says, do you work in Hackney Council? <laughs> like yeah. Hackney Council's reach is, is far and broad. and it's fa- <laughs> Hackney's world famous. It is, it's world Hackney famous. Camden, so I work for Camden Council and Hackney Council and it's weird all over the world. <laughs> Hackney and Camden. Internationally known, locally respected, you would think. Yeah. Do you, after you left Hackney, you never really came back to the UK. Um, well, yeah. You went, you went straight to Brussels. Right? Yeah. No, I went to Tower Hamlets for a year. Oh, yes. And then I went to Brussels. And yeah, it was funny because with the whole um, 2020 and not realising that it was the 
not only a new year but a new decade i realized i haven't worked in the uk for 10 years i left in 2010 when i moved to work in brussels so yeah something you think people should do more and i think particularly black people as in sometimes we don't it's not that we're not open-minded and a lot of us do go back home or travel but it's not something that's normally associated yeah definitely i definitely think that black people should work abroad more and actually i wrote about it in an essay that i have in a book uh there called know your place uh, essays for the working class by the working class which was published by dead ink book, books about two years ago and i say um explicitly yeah black people definitely should explore their options of working abroad especially when we were in the eu which we will still be obviously for another i don't know 10 days or whatever it is now um but yeah it was like europe was our oyster and we didn't exploit it enough i don't think in terms of working opportunities and i say that being conscious of the fact that not everybody can just get up and say i'm going to go and live and work in brussels or spain or Italy or whatever but um, I think you know what you said actually is quite accurate what we as black people tend to do is go to the country of our parents origin (laughs) you know and we'll go there and maybe we'll say we'll go and live there but you know the whole world is out there in theory I know in practicality it's not that easy but I do think if you fix your mind and open your mind to the fact that I can go anywhere and be anywhere I want to be that would be a good thing what advice would you give to somebody who's been working abroad like how did you get your first job working abroad um I actually you know it's very strategic in the sense that when I was thinking of moving abroad I wanted to go to Denmark because we actually had just come from Copenhagen (laughs) and I'd loved it so much and I thought oh I could actually live and work here but I didn't have a strategic advantage being in Copenhagen as I did in Brussels where the official language of the European Union is English and I'm a native English speaker and I work in corporate communications so I think you have to be really um, strategic about where it is that you would want to and plan to go and then work towards that goal like work out what your your USPs are and how you can get ahead in the country that you're thinking of going to because let me say this also about Brussels you know Brussels is a is a city and Belgium is a country where they have a huge North African population North that African. yeah North African population Moroccan Algerian you know um, where else uh, Morocco Algeria what Tunisian and you know when you go there these are people who were born and raised there like two generations three generations deep and they're unemployed and the thing is why can I as a black British person move to Belgium and get a job in no time and I literally got that job in about two months of looking where you have native uh, like Belgians who are Algerian and Moroccan who can't get jobs and obviously race plays a big issue in that as does religion a lot of the time but also the fact that I was at an advantage that I'm a native English speaker and I guess, you know, it got to the point where they don't care if you're black or if you're white, as long as you're, you can do the job and you speak English. So my point being, you know, think about where you're going and think about it strategically. Think about the asset you have. Yeah, think, exactly. In the UK. Yeah. You said that um, they, they probably didn't face discrimination during the recruitment process. Oh no, I I mean, okay, yeah. During the recruitment process, yeah, because of what your skills are and your CV. Yeah. How did you find living and working in Brussels? Wow. And I'll, I'll say that I've been to Brussels many times. <laughs> to go over to buy the beer. Yeah. And stuff. And one thing you notice is that when you go to like the European Union building, for example, the commission is just like all white people, yes. mostly men. Yes. Um, so what? Kind of very, very difficult. I mean, uh, let me say the first three months or six months, I was totally in love with it. I'm a political person to work at the heart of Europe was like a dream come true for me I loved what I was I loved being there let me say but the racism and the discrimination soon became apparent very very easily uh, within the workplace in things that I was being given to do the limited things that I was being allowed to do as opposed to people who didn't have the same skills and experiences I did were all of a sudden you know able to fly to the Congo or wherever they were flying to to do these jobs that I wasn't given access to um also obviously things that people would say about (laughs) you know about bananas and uh coffee actually you you know just ridiculous chocolate and ridiculous things that people would say i have a ton of things that i could relay here but i would rather just say it was an interesting time um Uh, It was difficult, but I'm glad I did it. I would definitely do it again. I would recommend other black people go and get the money and then, yeah, do what you've got to do. What do you miss about London? Um, I'll tell you what I miss most about London, the independence I have in London. So when I moved here in uh, June 2017, the 
the first three months were the most challenging three months. And every day I was saying, I'm going to go back to London because here, you know, now it's different, but then I couldn't just step out and go wherever I wanted to go because I didn't have the means, the transport means. I didn't have a car, um, you know, uh, getting on a trotro. I mean, you know. A trotro is basically a minibus that is packed. Yes, they're like our buses in London, but they're minibuses and they don't really have any kind of regulations, (laughs) I guess you would say. But um, yeah, you know, in London, when I'm there, I can do about five things in one day. I live in Northwest London, but I can go and see my mum in Watford. I can go to Central London and meet a friend. I can go to South London if I must and and see somebody else. You know, I could do all those things in the space of a day. But in Ghana, you can literally only do one thing in one day. And like our school library in Ashaiman, it's probably if the roads were good, about 40 minutes drive from here, but it takes us an hour and 45 minutes or two hours to get there and to come back. So that's four hours um, just because the roads are so bad. And so that's definitely what I miss. I miss the freedom of um, being able to travel as and when I want to and do what I, I want to. What do you not miss? What do I not miss? Questions I Yeah, I don't. I, do, you, do you know what? I mean, I don't know what I don't miss because I miss everything about it. You know, being here is not because I hate London at all. That's yeah. not the reason why I'm here. And as I said, I could easily move back to London tomorrow if I felt like it. Um, I don't miss all the racism. <laughs> and I don't even mean overt racism. Like one thing that living and working in mainland Europe taught me is that Britain is not that bad. That doesn't mean it's great. You know, I'm not Lawrence Fox. I'm not saying it's perfect, Um, but it's not that bad. But what I don't miss is, yeah, it's just the subtle racism. It's the subtle thing. London is not, and Britain is not an overtly racist place a lot of the times, unless you're Piers Morgan. And with the whole Meghan thing again, it was just commentator after commentator lining up on TV to say how racism has nothing to do with the fact that she would want to leave the UK. And in them sitting there and saying that, they're perpetuating the very racism that they're saying doesn't exist. And that's what really gets on my nerves at least you know admit it say yes you know we're, we're racist and we don't want you here and we're glad that this woman has gone and we're glad that we're leaving the eu because you know all the white foreigners will go and then eventually we'll get round to you guys do you know what i mean and that's what windrush well, scandal is i mean, I mean yeah, we, we were never angry enough about windrush it really yes it's quite extraordinary yeah people people passed away yeah elderly elderly people because because it affected people who came to the uk in the 50s and 60s these people were elderly yeah and also you could and working class people because there are people who have passports yeah they never traveled yeah so, and and um yeah it was all it, it was and still remains a, a, a awful and now we've got sadid and pretty two of the most <laughs> I've, got, I've got to hold my tongue <laughs> things i want to say about them they're just the two two of the worst humans um and i do judge them more harshly because they're non-white yeah actually um yeah highly assimilated assholes <laughs> yeah and you know i think that is part of the problem actually with us as a community in the uk is that too many of us have been uh, quite content and uh, actively wanting to assimilate rather than saying you know we are who we are we're here because you were there yeah. and we can live happily together you don't have to assimilate in order to do that yeah um but unfortunately i think a lot of us are sold out yeah, and that's similar to the mentality here, which says anything that has proximity to Europeanness is good. Yes. It's the same mentality we have. Yeah. And we just have to do the respectability po- politics. Exactly. And um, say, so, oh, we're, we're, it's like you want to be black on the outside, but European on the inside. Which yes. Is like, but some of us don't even want to be black on the outside, so. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I want to congratulate you on being the original Meghan Markle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have, you have without, the, without the prince, unfortunately. <laughs> I did. I did. So maybe I'll come back to London, find my prince, and then come out. Oh, <laughs> come out again. I'll do it all again. Is there any of them left? Is Andrew's going to get? Is Andrew divorced? <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> I can't remember. One of them's got to be left. Is there all, there's got to be a prince's cousin or something. There has to be. There has to be some duke somewhere, or I don't know something. And if you look, everyone's a prince here. Everyone's got a king. Or something well, that's like true. That that's true. So um, shout out for Sylvia. She forgot to. She, she left the UK and forgot to marry a prince. I is, did. You know, we all do it. <laughs> we all get to these things. Um, but thank you, thank you for welcoming <laughs> me and, and my girl into your beautiful home. Uh, no worries. Go we're going to go out and chop now. Right? Yeah, we definitely are. Okay. I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> thank you too. Bye. <laughs> so.
So that was Sylvia Arthur. Isn't she fantastic? People, surround yourself with excellence. And maybe some of the excellence will rub off on you. I'm hoping I came back from Ghana a better person by spending a bit of time in her company. Sylvia is a writer, journalist, communication professional, and a librarian. Please get involved in what she does. I'll tell you something, I've known her for years. And all this time, she was like, I'm going to go to Ghana and open a library. I'm going to go to Ghana and open a library. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. And one day, I open up the voice newspaper, and there is her big face. Not that she's got a big face, but you know what I mean. Um, there was a picture of her in the paper in front of her library and I couldn't believe she'd just gone and done it. She is a doer, not a talker and that is a a wonderful quality to have. So I love supporting her project and if you want to support it too, follow her on Instagram, follow her on uh, Facebook too. All the links you will need are in the description of this podcast and I'll put in some links to her publicity as well. You have been listening to Keeping Athena Company. If you've enjoyed this podcast and I hope that you have, please do what you normally do a podcast that you like. Share, comment, subscribe, tell your friends. If you haven't enjoyed it, um, tell your enemies, share this ordeal with them. They will thank you for it, I'm sure. In any case, appreciate your support and we will catch up next time.